when, when I hear a leader say, listen, I've never been down this road before, but here's what I'm going to promise you. I'm going to be with you every step of the way, and we're going to get through this. That, that to me, is, is a level of leadership that people will rally around because they're not expecting you to know it all and have it figured out. But in these moments, you just got to be honest, face it, and go, hey, guys, we've never been through a pandemic before. I don't know how to lead through this, but here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm not going anywhere. All right, Kirk, this is the Hard But Worth It podcast. Episode seven. There we go. And um, we're talking today about change. So we're just going to jump in, you and I, talking about our experiences, you know, trying to, to delve into things we've learned over the years, good, bad, ugly, mm-hmm. maybe some brilliant, beautiful moments, <laughs> but probably fewer of those and more of our mistakes. But yeah. hey. They're certainly easier to find. You get to learn by listening from our mistakes That's right. and save yourself a lot of hard. And then when you make them too, you'll recognize <laughs> that right. you made the same mistake, that's but that's okay because you learned. That's exactly right. So where do we jump in? You know, where, okay. where are you thinking? Where do we jump in yeah. on this? So I think the starting point for me when talking about change is that all change is hard. Right. It's just hard. Now, there's changes that are bad and changes that are good objectively. There's a scale of that, but that's not how people experience it. When we've developed a culture or the way we do things around here, and we're making little tiny incremental changes inside of that, that's not what we're talking about. Right. But when we're making the kind of change that goes outside of our culture, outside of our norms, of what we're familiar with, those are the kind of changes that you just have to know as a leader, you and your team and all those you lead are going to experience it as hard because it's kind of a threat or it could be a threat. That's the question. Is this a threat or not? So all change is hard. I think a lot of a lot of people who are in leadership think they like change. And so they 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 forget that most people don't. And maybe that's even true. But but even us as great leaders, I think I don't think it's right to say we like change. I think what we're saying is we don't like it or we we hate it less. <laughs> and I think that's that's probably true. Yeah. Change is just hard. And I think it's worthwhile just sitting in that for a minute and realizing how, as a leader, we take our time with change. Even when we're trying to change fast, we still sit and we think about it in our private places. We dialogue with other CEOs or other people. Yeah. We are, and I, I think of it as metabolizing it. We let it in our system. We get comfortable. We feel it out. We, and then, and then we're like, okay, I think this is going to be worth it. Well, and I think too, it's it's written in somewhere in the fine print of our CEO, <laughs> leadership, executive, yeah. job description, that somehow we need to make a change. Right, right? that's kind of our my, job. My job is to change mm-hmm. the world, or it's to change the organization, or I'm coming in to, to make the change that's necessary. And so we almost have this, this weird expectation in the way we think we're being measured on, on our performance to, to make change, mm-hmm. but at the same time, we don't necessarily like change happening to us. So there's this weird thing too, like, you know, uh, change that happens to me, and then there's change that I happen to, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. it's just, even, even then though, we don't always know the, the impact yeah. that I think we have when we say we're just going to make a change, right? you know, for the better. Even if it's for the better. Right. Yeah. Oh, so hard. I worked with a company. In fact, we still work with them. And f- f- long time ago, uh, four or five years ago, there was this line. They would say, oh, I've been happened to. Right. Right. I've been happened to. And I was like, we, we really need to not speak that way because this the, the environment itself, they worked in an industry that was going through radical change as an industry. And then they worked in an industry that had a ton of creativity built into it. And then they were a growing enterprise. So that's like three major influences that are just going to make it a very high change environment. And so if you can't roll with that, if you're not going to be able to move with that and you just see changes happening to you, I think you're in the wrong space because not all companies move that fast. A lot of companies live in a world where they're more likely to hold on to tradition. They're more likely to to refine and and lean on efficiency rather than change. Right. Well, I found too, like as, as I've grown in my business and in life in different contexts of leadership, whether it's working 
uh, like I said, in my business or with nonprofits and, and serving in different capacities that way. Um, the more I have a, a variety of people around me who might represent different types of personalities. So I know for me, I tend to lean towards a higher visionary ranking mm -hmm. in general. So uh, I know already that I have a desire to see things moving. In a sense, I could say I have a desire to see things changing in a way, even though I recognize there's a there's a realm of change that's in my blind spot that I'm probably really uncomfortable with. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's, there is this kind of... Um, impression that people might have with a, a high V type person that they just come in, you know, lighting matches everywhere and throwing them on the ground, you know, moving things around. And, and then you have others in your, in your world that are more uh, like the operators who like to come in and just crush things. Mm -hmm. I think they're also open to a lot of change, moving things around. Let's just get the job done, break through walls, do what we got to do. But then, but then we have people in our company who, who tend to more uh, gravitate to the processing side. And it's those people that I think also help bring balance for us to have, I think, a good maybe, yeah, I want to hear you speak to this, but kind of a good balance of enough change mm -hmm. that we can at least be change oriented. Because what we know too is not only change is hard, but change is a constant. Correct. It's happening right now. It's happening. And it's, it's something that you may not even be aware of that's going to pop up tomorrow. It's that client that you don't know that's coming on that's going to now bury you because they're 10xing yeah. you know, your scale. Or yeah. it's the opposite. It's that client that's leaving that represents you know 60% of your business. What are you going to do? I mean, there's all these things we don't see, yeah. but having the right team, I think, helps you stay you know, grounded enough in, in staying stable, but also open enough to having change as a as a you know a factor that you're willing to navigate. I mean, have you have you noticed that too just in the way teams operate? Yeah. There's a in in the life cycle of an organization, you can see a pattern emerge. Um, in the beginning, getting something started requires an enormous amount of the visionary operator, the the founder energy. And right. it's a it's an energy and they bring it and they're they're willing to sit in all the uncertainty and they take on risks a certain way and and they will build a culture around that that actually drives the business into its early success. And it's really, really important. Um, but over time, they're spinning off off products or business units or clients or or some level of activity that needs to be stabilized. And so you, they start to hire stabilizers. And then they'll start to try to make them founder energy, right? They're like, ah, right. quit, yeah. quit writing SOPs, right? <laughs> Standard operating procedures. Ah, why do I? They, it's, they're two different energies, founding energy and stabilizing energy. And then over time, if the company continues to grow, these founders are creating a bigger and bigger environment, more and more employees, more and more complexity, more and more clients that need to be processed or stabilized. And so in time, you can get a company where the stabilizers actually outnumber the founders, and you'll see a flip. Sure. And then you've got a, a culture that is dominated by the stabilizers, and, and the founders now feel out of place. And so if that tension between those two isn't managed well, the founders eventually leave um, because they want to go right. do something that's fun again, they'll yeah. say, right? And that's not wrong. Sometimes that actually is fine. But the problem today, as I see it, is change is happening so fast that most companies need to retain a founder and stabilizer relationship. Yeah, it's you really can't good. afford to lose that founding energy. The problem is they can't be in charge of every piece of the business because they're constantly tinkering and changing it. Right. It's also, I think, largely true, not always true, but largely true, that the ability to make money to profit from all this activity comes from the stabilizers. They make it efficient. They do the rinse, wash, repeat work. They make it, they're the yeah, well-oiled machine. Ma they're maximizing it. Yeah, yeah right. And sure. that's where profit comes from. The innovation and creative work is usually just expensive. Yeah. You need it in order to move into new markets, to grow, to develop, to stay fresh, but it's really hard to make money doing that. Um, and so this, this, this interplay between those two cultures. And I think of them as being two different cultures that often go to war or at least have significant tension. Sure. And we have to, I think we have to figure out a way to keep both of them vital and active within a company 
And instead of thinking of having a dominant culture and then everything else is somehow wrong, I think we want to think about having dominant cultures and subdominant cultures and then knowing when to flip back and forth. And it could be as often as in a given meeting. This meeting is the creative founder energy meeting. All the stabilizers are now subdominant. They don't have, they have a seat at the table, but they're not in charge. Right. But this meeting over here, logistics and how are we going to get supply chain across the country to work well? Like we don't need creativity on that. <laughs> yeah. I found that true just even in our business, you know, that as we've grown, we have different tables, different tiers of, of leadership teams that are all functioning in different capacities of leadership. And there are times where our T1 team will have our T2 team join. Right. And, and the thing is, is the T1, we mostly focus on the what question. It's, it's the vision. It's maybe a little bit of, it's a lot of goal setting and maybe a little bit of strategy. Mm -hmm. And then we tend to stop there and push that down to T2. But there's times where we'll bring the T to in who are more asking the how question. Right. And we have that exact conversation. Hey, right now, this is a what conversation and we need to vision. Mm -hmm. And so how is not allowed. Right. So we just take how and we say, hey, it's not in this meeting. We, we're going to get to the how, but it's not here today. That actually helps them have permission to get into that space where they're sometimes really great contributors to the vision but their default tends to be maybe in the house. So by giving them permission, they, they contribute really well and color that picture. Yep. And then when you're asking the how question, it's not time to ask why again. Right. Right. Why are we doing this? We answered that previously. Yeah. Let's not start that again. Yeah. Let's get to, yeah. I think that's really, really, really valuable, especially when um, the pace of change, the external pace of change is moving as fast as it is. Right. We don't have time to build an entire culture that stabilizes a company and then suddenly gets smashed in the face by a major technological change that this stabilizing team can't handle. Yeah. So he here we are again in that tension of it's not an either or. Right. But it really is a both and. And, you know, there's times you might go, oh, here we go again, both and. But it's so true. You need both because things are moving so fast a primarily dominant vision and operator type company is going to be moving so quick and changing things that they may not be establishing the roots necessary to really grow their productivity to the next level because they're always moving. And it's similar to like a potted plant. You know, it's always moving. It's going to stay kind of immature and underproduce. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you play over to the other side, which is the processors and the SOPs and all the, all the things that they do really well, you lack, I think, the risk, uh, the risk you have is lacking the openness to vision that can lead you to some, some real big blind spots that set you back maybe even into the first stage of dying. Right. Because you're so focused on the methods and the processing you're completely head down and you don't see this big meteor coming that your visionary and your operators uh, might have had a pulse to. So you really need now in this day yep. to have a blend of both where they're almost seen equal. Yep. So if we go way, 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 way back uh, to Heraclitus, which is a Greek philosopher, I think pre-Socratic philosopher, can't remember off the top of my head. So we're talking a long time ago and he's sitting there trying to think through early philosophy and he's trying to figure out what is the constant thing in our life? What is the stable thing? What is the one thing that you can sort of put your foot on and say, this is stable? And he comes up with this classic phrase that the only constant in life is change, which makes us change agents feel like we get the, the right to do whatever the hell we want, <laughs> right? Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Not all change is created equal and not all changes affects everything. Right. So I think about three kinds of change. Number one, there's, there's what we call stable change. And stable change is, um, it, throughout the human history, has been the more common, it's the most abundant change that we experience. And that is change that you can, you can see it coming. You can look out into the future and you can see that there is this change coming at you. It's moving at a pace that it, you know it's going to hit you, but you have time to prepare for it, to make a strategy, to even test your strategy, to train into it so that when it hits you, you have a sense of ready. I was ready for that change. That's a stable change. There's a thing called rapid change. And rapid change is when you can see it coming, you know it's going to hit you, but you don't have time 
to prepare. You can make some adjustments. You can kind of brace for it, and it hits you, and, and you didn't feel ready, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a surprise. That's rapid change. And then there's a thing called turbulent change, which is when the thing, like the only time you see it is in your rearview mirror. It hits you. You didn't know it was coming, and it has deep impact. Yeah. He was speaking to pandemic change at the time. He just didn't know <laughs> he that's didn't what know he was it. saying. That's right? right. So I think when Heraclitus says all, the only constant in life is change, that's true, but not all change is created equal. And we have to know which one we're dealing with because – and and I think that in the era in which we're living right now, we're experiencing less stable change and more turbulent hmm, change. That's interesting. Ex explain that a little bit. So I remember uh, raising our my boys in the era of technology, and the question was, how do you control screens and the and all this flow of information in? And my parents had to deal with radio and TV, and that was a whole different thing. Yeah. But now it's all there on the internet. And so as parents, we'd say, okay, you need to keep the screen in a public room, like keep it in. Don't let them have a, a computer by themselves in their office or in their bedroom, so that you can monitor. Well, that lasted for like a year or two. Um, and then it, it pretty soon, everyone's walking around with a, with a computer in their pocket. And now, like we did not, as parents, parenting strategies didn't see that coming, really doesn't know what to do with it. We're learning retroactively what the consequences are, and they're significant, both good and bad. But the thing that changed, and this was the turbulent change, is for the first time in human history, Children, the children we raised, have 100% access to information without an adult's permission. Hmm. That's never been true. And there's no parenting strategy from the past that was designed to deal with that well. And as a generation of parents, we're like, I don't know how to deal with this. And we're, we're running a bunch of experiments. Some people have really choked down and limited a screen time with their kids dramatically. Some have gone whole hog. Some are, I mean, we're all trying something different, but we're going to retroactively figure it out. And then social media arrives in the middle of all this. And I was really excited and we were going to democratize the world. And it was, and it was a utopian notion. And it turns out there was a lot more going on than we right. realized. That was a change that we didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just thing after thing after thing. Yeah. Those things are happening to us in technology, but they're also happening to us, or as a result, there's societal level changes going on. There's culture level changes going on. And you can mark, you can go way back to the Gutenberg press, which represents this movement of information and how the enlightenment changed Europe. And it was dramatic. And there's this, this thing that made information readily available and it just revolutionized Europe. It caused like a hundred years of war, the Gutenberg world. And now we live in the Google world, and it's just as dramatic. <laughs> you can actually hear this in the parenting notion again. In If you're a, from the Gutenberg world, which I am, you are, we were raised in that context, and Google world emerges, and we don't know what to do, so we tell our kids, you got to get off the screens. And there's a period of time when they'd say, well, what am I supposed to do? It's raining outside, and we would say, read a book. A book is just a technology Right. That transfers information. Yeah. And it does it actually pretty it's a poorly. Type, it's a type of screen. It's just a really <laughs> bad screen. And what we needed to do was learn how to deal with this change such yeah. that we could teach them how to engage their screen in highly effective ways. But we didn't know. So we just said, do what I used to do. Read a book. Which ironically, I can also control which books are in the house. Right. So that's convenient. So this change we're experiencing right now is it's a lot of it is technology. Those are the easy things to see, but it's it's affecting our culture. It's affecting how we look at the world, how global, how we think of ourselves as a global family. It's affecting our moral structures, our belief systems, how what things mean, and it's just overwhelming and dramatic. Yeah, and I'd say it's largely turbulent change we're experiencing. Yeah, and and within that too, I think. Um, what I what I believe some of the best leaders are doing today is they're recognizing that their job is essentially to stand out in front of the people they love, they lead, out in front of their organizations, and trying to at least uh, get a perception of the sign of the times. Essentially, it's it's almost like a prophetic insight. And it, that's a weird word to use in the sense of leadership. But I think the leaders who are leading the best in our day 
have a sense of they're out in the front and they're they're trying to look way out and see what might be coming as best as possible at least at least the current and the wind and and sometimes they actually will like we said earlier happen to change they will make change happen but that that's a different path that we're not really talking about here we're talking about when change comes knocks on your door doesn't always have, you know, a seven day or a, or a three month advance notice of an appointment on your calendar. Yeah. How do we create an environment as leaders to allow that to happen as healthy as possible? I think one way is we have to lead different. Yeah. Well, what are some other ways you're thinking about this environment for the best possible outcome of change? Yeah. What can we do as leaders? I think, okay, so Change always activates, I'm going to say, change always activates fear. The fear is there to help focus us because we're moving some, some, from something we know into something we don't know, and that is kind of scary. It might not be easy. It probably won't be easy. It'll probably be hard, and it might be dangerous. So it's going to activate fear. So what we don't want is it to activate anxiety, a lot of times you use fear and anxiety interchangeably. Sure. Um, and that's fair. But I think differentiating between the two is helpful. To have fear about something is to recognize this might be dangerous, but I'm going and therefore I will engage it as though it's dangerous. Um, and that's fine. That's a useful fear. And you can know what to do with that fear. Anxiety is uh, my favorite definition comes from Seth Godin. He said this one day in a podcast, and I just. I really hooked into it. He said, anxiety is pre-living failure. It's, it's recognizing it could be dangerous and then assuming the danger will be activated and assuming as a result of that, we will fail and then pre-living that experience. And that can be maybe even helpful to be able to imagine that. But if you can pre-live failure, but you cannot pre-live success, it's not helpful. So anxiety uh, lowers your IQ. Anxiety puts you into a fight, fight, or flee, freeze frame, and that is not a good place to lead from. Right. It's not a good place to follow from. It's not a good place to be. So when we're, when we're helping our teams navigate change, when we're leading teams, it's okay to have them in a state of fear. It's okay to be in a state of fear. But if you push change to the point of anxiety or if you have a team that can't know the difference, yeah. it's hard. It's hard to navigate. And you'll watch some really bad behaviors emerge and you'll watch people start to defend territory for survival's sake. And when people are defending for survival, I mean, they'll fight to the death. Right. Right. So the key right now, one of the keys right now is to constantly be developing your team, developing your people. We often call this emotional intelligence to have a resiliency and an agility that can handle the fear of change without going to anxiety. If you can do that, your teams will move much, much yeah. more effectively through change. And so much of that I found is really set first by the tone of the leader or the senior leadership. And it's taking a posture that says, I'm not going to try to control this. Yes. But actually, we're going to hold it open-handedly, but have the honest conversations to go, hey, like when, when I hear a leader say, listen, I've never been down this road before, but here's what I'm going to promise you. I'm going to be with you every step of the way, and we're going to get through this. We're going to come out on the other side, and we're going to find a way. That, that to me is, is a level of leadership that people will rally around because they're not expecting you to know it all and have it figured out. They know you've probably never been there. And if you say you have and have it all figured out, they just know you're blowing smoke anyway. And that does that actually works against the credibility you're trying to build. But in these moments, you just got to be honest, face it, and go, hey, guys, we've never been through a pandemic before. I don't know how to lead through this. But here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm not going anywhere. And I know there's a route through this and we're going to navigate it and we're going to get through the other side. And my hope is that you join me and we get through this together. Man, that forges a type of morale and a sense of a rally cry that maybe gets you further than you even thought on the other side, because now people, you know, they want to be a part of that. What, what are, again, what are some other leadership things we can do when we're in that place. Because, you know, AI is coming, right? <laughs> yeah. I heard about this. But AI is coming and it's going to, you know, it's going to ruin the world. Right. You know, that's what that's some of the narrative out there. This is the fear and anxiety language yep. that's leading you to the anxiety place. But we know 
A AI was just, you know, another industrial revolution, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And it was the big thing that was going to change. And it's not to reduce what AI will have, uh, the impact that AI will have on the world, but it's not the last thing that's coming either. We're going to survive AI. Hey, we want to take a minute and interrupt really quick and just let you know that we just launched a new website. We're really excited by it. Uh, you can visit it at iconcoaching.com. That's I-K-O-N coaching.com. You can see more videos about our framework and what we're doing as coaches. The, the coolest thing you can do there is you can actually schedule time with Mitch or Hope or myself. Uh, we can do it in person or via Zoom. And we can f you can find out how some of these ideas that we're playing with could help you change and navigate through change in your own life and your own businesses. And if you're watching this uh, episode here, it's probably because you found us on the Hard But Worth It podcast. So while you're there, if you'd like it, subscribe to it, you know, turn that bell on and then maybe share it to other people if you liked it so that we can get the word out and continue to grow our presence. We really appreciate it. So let me just, let me stop you there because AI is the perfect example of this. Um, we, I don't remember the term machine learning. Yes. Right. Because our psychology was not ready to admit that we've been living with AI for quite a while. So we called it machine learning because it seemed a little bit more palatable probably, but we've actually been letting AI make decisions for us for years now. It shows up in, in all the different searches that we do. It's deciding what it should show us on Amazon. It's deciding what music we should listen to. So, but we called it machine learning. And then all of a sudden chat GPT hits the market and we can't, we, we have to face that there's this thing. So now we call it AI. And it's happening so fast to us that, again, it's, it's turbulent change. And people are trying to figure out what to do with it. And a lot of people I'm talking to in the business community just are wanting to walk away from it. Oh, that's just, that's just terrible. I have ethical issues with it. It's, right. it's scary. Ah, oh, it's going to ruin the world. And so they just don't engage. They want it to just go away. And it's not going to go away. It's coming. It's going to actually have some level of significant change. It already has. So we have to figure out what are we going to do with it. And this is one of those changes where the anxiety levels can be so high that we just retrench back into what is known. The problem, though, is when people say AI is scary and dangerous, I think they're probably right. A number of months ago, maybe, maybe longer ago than that, there was a survey done of a bunch of people that are active in the AI industry, the coders, the developers, the, the people who are making all this stuff happen. And they, they went through and they asked them a bunch of questions. But one of them was something like, I can't quote it precisely, but something like, what do you think the probability is that the introduction of AI into society could have an, be an extinction event or a, have a dramatic negative impact on the human experience? And all these people who are deep into it and currently building it collectively came to the kind of the average was there's a 10% chance that happens. Huh. So not like a 0.01%. Like, yeah. like, like the, the scariest I thing. I don't know that I'd bet on those odds when it comes <laughs> right. to like the world the, ending. The human race <laughs> yeah, exactly. being made irrelevant. So this thing that we think is scary, the people who are building it are saying, yes, that could happen, but they're continuing to build it. But the ones inside that community who have ethical issues or don't think this is a good direction to go are starting to walk away. They're like, oh, I have ethical issues. I have to leave. I have to not participate in building it, which only leaves the people in it who are maybe a little bit too utopian or maybe going to be corrupt about it. It's the wrong way to approach this. What I think we all need to do is recognize that this change is going to be hard. There's all kinds of potential upsides. But it's going to be disruptive, and it could be really bad. And so the best thing we can do is to engage. We need to bring the more people, the better, to come provide oversight and input and look at it and play with it and direct it. And if you're scared, if there's fear in your heart, that might be the very reason to engage. Yeah, because quitting in a situation like that doesn't stop it. Not at all. Right. So like, I think when you're, when you're talking about change in a domain that you feel you have absolute control over, <laughs> right. then I think you might be able to say, you know what, let's stop, pull the plug. We're going to quit this and move on. But to walk out on something that level, you know, that size, uh, you know, your, your leaving doesn't stop it from happening. So I, I agree with you. I mean, like, how do we show up with uh, a sense of violating our moral convictions, but still have a seat at the table to shape and influence. I think that's some of the hardest and highest call of, of the work a leader might ever do in their I life. I totally agree. Yeah. The, the idea, 
<laughs> I've never I've never found a, a smooth way to say this, but the idea that leadership has this moral obligation to it to keep us to our morals. There's a there's a piece of that that's absolutely right. Um, they do help. Great leaders do help guide us through moral ambiguity towards the good. The problem is a lot of leaders are actually turning things that aren't moral at all into moral issues. Right. There, AI is not a moral issue, in my it's opinion. It's amoral, right. It's amoral. It's, it's a thing. It's a technology. Mm-hmm. How we relate to it, what we use it for is where the, where the corruption could occur. And so for leaders to have a moral issue with AI, is to play, it's just complete misuse. Well, they have a moral issue, really, with the human condition, right? That's really what they're saying, that it, it's, it's the hands that it falls into that they're really not trusting. Yeah. It's, it's the people, because you're right. That it's neutral. It's it's the same conversation with the gun or you know any other thing. It's mm-hmm. like it's it's the hands that it's put into that determines whether it's good or bad, helpful or not helpful. And leadership is about showing up and creating the ecosystems and environments where we can actually do the best kind of work and move us towards the good. What I think a lot of people are doing is they're turning things they're unfamiliar with into moral issues. And it's like you're just unfamiliar with it. Lean in, get curious. This is the uncertainty of the future. And one of the things that I think leadership is for is to guide us effectively into that uncertainty. Now, one of the challenges, I think, going all the way back to the beginning is not all change is worth it. (laughs) And how do you know the difference? And honestly, don't know that you can. Right. But you have to engage it to know the difference. So you've got, I think what leaders do is they play with ideas. They play with change in ways that don't have the massive impacts, but they can play with it in ways that get a thing um, to this, like you can get an idea to a place where it's like, okay, I'm willing to bet something on this, not my entire company culture, but something. So let's put it to work and you get people that are willing to come play with you there. And then you've got to expand the group of people that are playing with it so that you can refine it. Right. And they'll little like you'll show up with something that you think is brilliant. Like this is going to be amazing. And then what they do is they start fixing it. Yeah. And that's what they're for. Because while it might be a brilliant concept, it's not executable yet. Yeah. Well, and you were saying a moment ago, and I agree, you didn't say it in these words, but you were alluding to the fact that when crisis or change hits you, that kind of change, Mm -hmm. the sudden change that maybe we didn't see coming or it was moving so fast, it it kind of surprised us. There's a level of focus and clarity that does happen as a result of that. So we could say that the good of being impacted by change that we didn't see coming is it actually wakes us up a bit to get really clear, mm-hmm. right, on what might be the most important thing. And in those moments, we we can only react, but typically our reaction turns into maybe us innovating uh, new ways, new thoughts right. of actually, you know, now we're forced into this change, but now we're adapting and we're pivoting. And we may find new products, new services, new markets, you know, whole new approaches to our business because this showed up in our lap. So what might have appeared to be a big disruption could turn into a gift uh, when when we actually work it that way into our business. So by creating an environment where we're maybe a little more prepared, a little more open to change, you know, what might be some of the opportunities we're missing in our business today because we're not you know, we're not playing with those ideas and we're, we're waiting for the crisis to show. But what if we didn't have to have the crisis? Right. You know, AI is the example we're talking about. But what we're saying is, you know, who, who's doing the work today to think, could AI actually impact my business in a negative way? But then also, what are the opportunities for it to impact my business in a positive way? It mm-hmm. doesn't matter what you're doing. It's worth mm-hmm. having that conversation rather than waiting for it to just show up on your porch you know, ring your doorbell and surprise you, and you weren't expecting it. The writer's strike that was going on down in Hollywood uh, recently, um, they had all sorts of things they wanted to get fixed inside of the, the industry because moving from uh, studios to streaming has radically changed how Hollywood produces content. And it's having probably an arguably negative impact on writers, so they're working on it. But one of the lines they wanted in that contract, which I think immediately got rejected, and I doubt they're fighting for it, was they wanted to make sure that AI would never be used to write a script. They were trying to protect their jobs in the old form of writing. 
AI is absolutely going to be used to write scripts. And some writers are, we, we will not need as many writers as a result of that. And so this change is going to disrupt and in some cases take away what some people find highly valuable, their jobs. We call this creative destruction. In our culture, we have decided that innovation and creativity are more important than maintaining the status quo. On the whole, that's how we operate here in America. Not all cultures are like that. Right. We welcome creative destruction. One of the challenges as a leader is recognizing that some of the decisions you're going to make, and the, the more people that you lead, the more significant this is, but some of the decisions you're going to make are going to literally destroy someone's livelihood. Right. You're going to make a decision that causes major shifts to occur, and someone's going to get caught in that crack. It's an unavoidable part of the deal in our culture. And it's really hard to know when to focus on what's best for the company and when to focus on what's best for an individual. Because some of our decisions, the individual is going to be able to say, you ruined my whatever. And that will be true. These decisions that we're having to make sometimes of not only adopting, of not only seeing change, but then adopting change, they're high stakes and highly consequential. And not everybody wins in the moment. But if we can build cultures and people who can navigate and be adaptable so that when their job ends over here, they can do the work to get over there into the new space, yeah. it's going to create a more innovative and creative society. Yeah, yeah I think you, you create an environment where the probability of that occurring better Right, you know, increases. Yep. Rather than not, so the so it really is just creating this culture where the impact of the change is somewhat lessened mm -hmm. because you're prepared for it. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't know when, you don't know why, but you know it's coming. And we have a culture that, for the most part, embraces it. Not every change is worth it, but <laughs> yeah. we know some change will be, and so we have this open sense then we're not like Tommy Boy being smacked across the face with a two by four, right. wondering where it left the mark because we saw it coming. Yep. At least if we get hit in the face, we saw it coming, we can prepare for it, and now we can you know, act into that. Yeah. So here's, a, here's some things about change that aren't worth it. I think there is the, a change that is ego-based, that leaders are doing ego-based change sometimes. They're thinking about themselves. They're thinking about what's gonna make them look good and then they try to do change initiatives based on that. Right. Those changes aren't worth it. They cause disruption inside of a company. I think there are changes that can be done way too fast. There's a notion that says, just because you see that you need to make a change, like it is good to go through the process of seeing that this change is coming and I need to make a change. But timing always matters. And there's times you have to sit on it for a long time yeah. to prepare a company to go through it or to recognize oh gosh, we just came through a major change. We need to lick our wounds, restabilize, reconnect as a team. Everybody needs a vacation and then we'll go after the next one. Yeah. So timing always matters. I think that when you're making a change and you're going to put too much stress on an organization that can't handle it, that's a bad change. It's not worth it. You're reminding me with uh, the first point you talked about, the ego, mm -hmm. but Jim Collins wrote a book, a follow-up book, to good to great, and I don't know how popular it was because I don't see it around very often, right. but it's called How the Mighty Fall. And it's it's a follow-up to the same organizations that he, he, he studied over their upside to then why did some of those fail, you know, five or 10 years later? And he, he began to pull out some of the, the themes there. And one of the themes was this idea that he calls a hubris. Uh -huh. And it's this, this thought, the CEO, the founding team, because we've always won, we will always win. Right. And so as a sense of being bored, because they tend to be uh, innovators and entrepreneurial, so they want to do new things, they, under the guise of we will succeed at everything, divert a lot of their creative resources to changes from their core business. And then, you know, the flywheel, which they talk about the flywheel in good yep. to great, starts to lose its momentum. And by the time they actually catch it, uh, they've lost so much momentum that the size of the organization just is too heavy yeah. to get any lift again. But it's interesting you talk about ego. Um, and I think we have to be careful as leaders to go, just because we're bored, mm -hmm. just because it seems fun, let's make a change. No, what we're saying is change is always hard. Mm -hmm. 
there's another um, misread that I think um, I had to learn about this myself. And then I've actually walked away from business opportunities because the change was available. The change was necessary. The change would have been good, but I didn't want to. And so there, there are some situations where in an organization you recognize, oh, we need to make a change, and, but I'm not the leader for it. I'm not the right guy. And so we can't lead that change. But because I'm in the position and because I want the salary and because I don't want to be the guy sure. that walks away, because someone told me somewhere that quitters never win and winners never quit, <laughs> which is only profoundly half true, I stay at it. And the change that was actually necessary was I need to get out of the way. And that's, a, that's another place where it's like, yes, the change is going to be worth it, but it won't be worth it for me. And so I can't lead it effectively because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I don't want to do it. Yeah. A lot of what makes change hard is it's loaded with conflict. It's loaded with multiple perspectives and multiple opinions. And when you're trying to make a ton of decisions about how to do a thing and where to go and get this whole team oriented in a new direction, what it it has a tendency to be a high conflict environment. I don't mean bad conflict. I just mean it's not – we don't all agree about what to do at any given time and how to apply resources. And, and so one of the attributes of, I think, people that are really good at change is they're really good at engaging – not just engaging conflict, but actually doing the work to get it resolved. And then when you're walking through change, especially rapid or turbulent change, you kind of need to do that fast. And this is one of the places where I actually fall down. I'm like, I think I'm pretty good at engaging, resolving conflict until it's high stakes, (laughs) right? Or until I care a lot or until uh, there's all kinds of ways I'm not good at this. And so being able to consistently over a long period of time continue to engage and resolve conflict after conflict as you navigate through this process is actually really heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. Because what you're doing is you can't personally make all the decisions. It's, it's, it's an ecosystem that's going to do that. And so I always think of this as the process of holding, you're holding tension. You're just, and if you squeeze too tight on it, it's, there's a violence involved. It's too much pressure. But if you just let it go, it's like you're just abdicating. I don't know. What do you want to do? It's not a great leadership question. Um, but finding a way to hold tension and keep the tension focused on each other so it can resolve. And then the next one, and just consistently holding this tension as you navigate through, I think that requires incredible strength of, of character. It requires insight. It requires you to be able to see the tensions and then and then figure them out, release them in certain ways. And again, watching masters do this is just, it's, it's extraordinary. Right. But you will never, you will never make everybody happy in the process. No. Some lives will be undone in the process. Some people be, it'll be revealed that they're not doing a good job or they're not capable of doing what comes next or, or uh, it just, there's all kinds of potential um, challenges to that. And being able to hold this tension and navigate a team through change, it's where the leadership notion of having arrows in your back comes from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And can you handle it? Yeah. But all the way back to the beginning, I think to do any of that, you first have to understand that change is hard. It takes years to master being able to walk people through it. Um, being able to walk yourself through it. It takes um, incredible self-awareness because you have to be you have to be self-centered, centered in yourself in order to not need to have nothing to prove. In that state, it increases your ability to see, like you were talking about that prophetic notion of being able to see into the future, being able to see what's yeah, coming. Right. And I think what they're doing is they're so unconcerned about themselves that they can see more clearly. Yeah. And, and I think, too, what's important in that is, you know, learning as that kind of leader that not everyone is going to see your positive hmm. vision, which is really a change. But I think we recognize, too, no, changing your goal from being a $5 million company to growing to $7 million or $8 million may sound exciting, But to some on your team, they want to be excited, but they're also dealing with the the fear of what does that mean for me and my job. There's there's a real change uh, 
equation Mm -hmm. that needs to be factored into that because it's like, if not, we get disillusioned as leaders sometimes with why isn't everyone so excited about this? (laughs) It's because you just talked about, you know, increasing our company by 30%. And that has an impact on my job. Who's going to do this? Who's going to hire all the people? Who's going to train? It's like, man, I wasn't even thinking about that. Right. I'm just thinking about we're going from this peak to this peak. And when we get there, we're going to take selfies. We're going to have lunch, <laughs> plant a flag, and we're going to have a really good time. Yeah. But they're going, nope, the process there is all change. Uh-huh. And I'm currently working the amount of hours I want to work. Yes. And you're adding all this, and I have to, right? Or there's the... um. We actually, we're actually dealing with this with a couple of companies right now where we were at the pace of change we were on, the pace of growth we were on, we were probably going to be able to promote from within. And so there's people who thought they would become the next directors and the next things as we grew. Oh, that's a hard one. But we're moving so fast. The opportunities are so good that we're having to just go out and hire competency. We don't have time to wait for you to get ready. Right. And we just stifled your promotion track. Yeah. It's at least what they're thinking. And I don't think that's actually right. I think we're creating room for more promotion. But the job title you were expecting to get just got filled. And so, yeah, anxiety, fear. How is this going to affect me? Where are my dreams? Does this company even care about me? Starts to show up. So CEOing is really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> So many other factors. <laughs> <laughs> I think leadership and then the CEO, executive leadership, and but there's all kinds of, of places where you, you want to be in charge. The leader wants to be the one who has the influence. We want to have an impact. And I think that's a healthy, awesome, sacred thing to want in the world. But what you have to understand is that it's the hardest job in the world. It's, it is burdensome. Um, one author says, the reason we give you the big salary in the airplane in the corner office is because we're bribing you to do the worst job in the company. (laughs) And I don't know that that's entirely true, but it is a useful framework to think about. Being the one who has to navigate or is charged with navigating a company through turbulent change, through the cultural shifts, the technology shifts that we're experiencing is extraordinarily difficult. Um, don't at, don't raise your hand for that if you're not ready for it. <laughs> and then there's some like us that we're still waiting for the big salary, the airplane, <laughs> and the big office, and we still do it anyways. I know. What yeah. kind of crazy <laughs> is that? <laughs> ah, well, that's what therapy is for. <laughs> so change is hard. It's not always worth it. But to not change is to die. It's change is the only constant. So if you are going to try to live in a world that never changes, your world will get incredibly small and you'll end up alone in the end, or at least with everybody else that doesn't want to change. And you'll be living behind some big protective wall. <laughs> so I think as leaders, it's important that we um, we become the ones that are maybe first. We, we take those steps into the uncertainty first. We go figure out and scout the landscape. Um, and I think one of the great services that we can do is make the path into change um, more palatable, um, smoother, um, and have an increased likelihood that not only will people make the changes necessary, but they'll enjoy the journey. Whenever we're talking about change, I think people want a how-to, how to navigate change. And I think by this point, they might be getting used to us saying, we don't really have a how to navigate change. Um, there's not a formula for it. There are some best practices. It has to do with being a person that can navigate change, becoming the best version of yourself and then doing it for the benefit of others. So you've probably figured out by now that we're having this somewhat open conversation about the challenges and difficulty of change because what we want you to understand more than anything is that you can become the kind of person, if you're not already, that can do this. Or if you're doing it already, you can get better at it. But you can't get better at it by following a formula. You can't go read a book on change and then be a change expert. It is a constant commitment to becoming the best version of yourself and then being able to navigate into uncertainty without something to prove but plenty to learn so that you can create space for others to do the same. If you'll go on that journey, you will become the kind of person that can navigate change. 